Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of the People, Places, Planet Podcast. My name is Georgia Ray, and I am your host. As a young person new to the environmental field, I often find myself thinking about the future of the field, the climate's biggest challenges, and how to maintain optimism. After talking to many of my peers, I've learned I'm not alone. In today's podcast, I am honored to welcome Shella Chowdhury, one of my colleagues here at ELI who just finished up two years as a research associate and will be attending Yale Law School in the fall to pursue a career in climate justice. In 2020, she graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in political science and a BS in society and environment. She is also the founder of Perennial, the undergraduate environmental journal at Berkeley. At ELI, Shella spent much of her time on environmental peace building. She has been a trusted aide to ELI's Carl Brook, a senior attorney and director of ELI's international programs in carving out this nascent field. They have worked towards establishing intellectual and practical boundaries in this interdisciplinary space and tackled complicated questions pertaining to monitoring and evaluation. Like how do you prove causation for things like peace and the environment, which exist on such long time horizons? We will also talk a little bit about Shella's domestic work with the local government environmental assistance network and differences she sees working in domestic versus international environmental context. Finally, we will touch on Shella's past academic work in studying cooperation between NGOs in the Global North and Global South. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Shella Chowdhury. Shella, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Such a pleasure to be here, Georgia. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. And to get us started, can you take us a moment to give our listeners a little background on environmental peace building? What is it? And what do our listeners need to know to understand the rest of this podcast episode? Absolutely. I would be happy to. And hopefully I can uh, give an explanation that would do justice to the long history of work that Eli has done in this field. And so environmental peace building, as you mentioned, is still a very nascent field in a lot of ways. I would define it as the intersection between peace, conflict and the environment. Interventions in environmental peace building tend to focus on the relationship between peace, conflict, and the environment, either figuring out how natural resource management can play a role in facilitating peace, but also thinking about how peace and conflict impact the natural environment. For example, of course, the consequences of you know, uh, interstate conflict or armed warfare on the natural environment. And so it really focuses on, in on those two different aspects and tries to think about what we can do uh, in the community to help facilitate peace and protect the environment at the same time with synergy. That sounds like really interesting work. And I know you in particular have been involved with creating standards for monitoring and evaluation in this field. Could you give us an example of good environmental peace building methods as well as a strategy that maybe hasn't worked so well? Yeah, that is a great question. So one of the interesting things about taking on work in such a growing and new field is that the body of literature and the way of doing things in this field is still very much being established. And so in particular, anyone who's worked uh, with an organization like the Environmental Law Institute or similar organizations that do direct interventions has had to do what's called monitoring evaluation. We call that m and for short. So the process of reporting, um, you know, taking accountability, showing your funder how the funds have been spent and also communicating impacts to the rest of the world and to other people in the field. And so I think that this is a particularly difficult question uh, in the environmental peace building field where you're dealing with a lot of intangible concepts. So for example, we can say pretty easily and pretty easily measure how much land has been covered by an environmental intervention. So for example, it's not too hard or difficult to say like, I've planted such and such number of trees or like we've managed this many hectares with this um, farming method but it can be very, very difficult to figure out what impact that has on the relationships between people. So for example, one might have a hypothesis that involving two conflicted groups together and managing natural resources might increase cooperation and trust between those groups, but it's very hard to show causation in that situation, right? Like how do we know it was having them work together on this particular project and that there weren't other factors in the environment or other factors in the conflict dynamic that resulted in the changes we see? 
And also, how can we even say, you know, how do you measure trust? Questions like that really motivated us to try and figure out a way to collect methods for improving monitoring evaluation in this area. So the purpose of this project that we've been working on at ELI for the last two years has been to create a monitoring evaluation toolkit that practitioners can use. Um, so we've been speaking to a lot of experts, speaking to a lot of different organizations, and just trying to get a sense of what people do, just because the literature on monitoring evaluation for environmental peace building is, is basically non-existent uh, at this point. So in this field where you're establishing these new tools for monitoring and evaluation, are there any examples that you look to in the past of, you know, this group did monitoring and evaluation and environmental peace building more broadly really well, and this group really kind of dropped the ball in terms of environmental peace building or should have been incorporating environmental peace building methods and really didn't? Yeah, so I think part of the reason that this project is so important is because environmental peace building can be such a high stakes situation. When you're working in an area that you know is impacted by conflict, choosing not to spend the time to learn more about that context and figure out exactly what your intervention is dealing with can have really dire consequences. And so one of the important reasons we do monitor evaluation is to be able to assess what works and what doesn't work in this field. For example, a lot of the work we've done um, with the environmental peace building program, not only with the modern evaluation work, but even before that, is about the concept of conflict sensitivity. And so conflict sensitivity is really just the practice of, you know, how well and how thoughtful have you been about incorporating the conflict dynamics into the design of your project and into the implementation of your project. And assessing the conflict sensitivity, I think, is a very important part of modern evaluation for environmental peace building. So what's interesting about environmental peace building in a lot of ways is that it's extremely interdisciplinary. And a lot of times, because it's a nascent field, people who are kind of participating in this work might not even realize that they're doing environmental peace building work. A lot of times you might have peace building experts who end up using natural resource management practices and vice versa. You have environmental conservation experts operating in a conflict affected environment. And so one example I think that sticks out as a particularly upsetting and negative situation in the history of environmental peace building um, is a situation that took place at Virunga National Park. And so that project was not an environmental peace building project, despite being an environmental project that took place in a conflict affected area. And so an environmental organization had decided that as part of their work on conservation and to protect the area of Virunga National Park, it would make sense for them to intervene by training several of the park rangers to use uh, automatic weapons to be able to keep security in that area and to be able to prevent poachers from getting into the park. And once the money had run out on that project and the project reached conclusion, that environmental organization left. So what they hadn't realized at the time is that, you know, once they left, they didn't leave precautions in place uh, and they left these park rangers with these automatic weapons that they had paid for and this training. And what did end up happening was that several of the park rangers ended up joining a guerrilla group and um, it caused a lot of injury to other people in the area. And certainly it did not have the environmental um, outcomes that they had hoped for. So really, if they had sent, uh, taken some time to think about you know, where they were operating, what other contexts and variables were in that operating area, how the conflict impacts the park that they were working on, that might not have been a situation. They might have judged that it made more sense to not involve automatic weapons in their intervention. That sounds like a, a really tragic situation there and actually reminds me of something that's been in the news recently, which is a story surrounding Delia Owens book, Where the Crawdads Sing. For those of you who are listening who might not know, Owens has come under recent fire for her involvement in the death of a poacher in Zambia on the conservation estate run by her husband. An ABC documentary follows not only the conservation of elephants done by the couple, but also shows the murder of a poacher that tried to enter the land. So that really reminds me of this situation that happened in Virunga, although, you know, a little bit different. But 
Shella, thinking about that situation, how can environmental peace building help us tackle these complicated and tragic situations that occur when environmental conservationists enter spaces without an understanding of the local context? Yeah, that is a great question, Georgia, and also, of course, a very tragic situation. I think it really shows off how interconnected everything is. One of the big things we've talked about in the research with modern evaluation has been the importance of adopting a systems perspective on the work. So understanding that whether you're doing environmental work, development work, um, environmental conservation work, peace building work, these things are all playing within the same system, interacting with different actors, different variables, different contexts. And it's of course very complicated, but you need to be able to understand that we can't just silo something. There's no isolation just because we wanna work on environmental conservation. I remember early on in my work uh, at the Environmental Law Institute, hearing someone at a larger international organization say something to the effect of, my job is just to take care of elephants. I don't really worry about the other things involved in that process. And I think that that's a very antiquated view. I think certainly a lot of young people are starting to understand the way systems work uh, in the context of environmental work. For myself, having been trained in society and environment, which is a relatively newer degree at UC Berkeley, the whole concentration of the degree is how do human systems, how does sociology and society impact the environment and vice versa? These things are all working in tandem together. And so environmental peace building being such an interdisciplinary field, I think really emphasizes that connection and being able to focus in on those connections, thinking about, you know, I want to protect these animals, but also what does that mean? What are these animals relationship to the environment? What's the environment's relationship to the people who live here already? Um, what is my role? What can I do to facilitate protection, not just through violence or through arming myself, but also at root systemic levels? What can we do to improve the relationship between the people who live here and the animals I want to protect or the environment that I want to protect or the natural resource I want to protect? And really taking our interventions to that level rather than just kind of putting a bandaid on something by putting a fence up around an area. I think that that's something that's very important. And I think that an environmental peace building perspective and framework can really help a person to see how all these different variables interact. I really like how you describe yourself as taking this systems approach and especially highlighting the work that you did during your undergrad degree. And, you know, I'd love to talk to you about environmental peace building all day. You have so much interesting stuff to say about it. But I do want to shift a little bit to some of the work that you did in undergrad. Your senior thesis was titled The North-South Divide, Challenges to Achieving Equity in International NGO Partnerships for Climate Resilience in Bangladesh. Can you tell our listeners a little more about what you learned about nonprofit cooperation through that project and maybe, you know, how this same systems approach influenced that work? Yeah, definitely. And I can think about my thesis all day and it's nice to have the opportunity to do so just because I've been away from that research for a while. Um, but, you know, a large reason for me wanting to pursue work in climate justice and particularly focusing on international work is because of my background as a Bangladeshi person. And so growing up, I've had the opportunity to really see what a country in climate crisis looks like. Um, when I was younger, I had a lot of experiences there with just insanely heavy rains. And I think one of the things that really impacted me was just you know, seeing an entire flooded street, hearing about the way people have lost people in those conditions, why people have been injured by those conditions, and understanding as I grew older that it's very connected to the lifestyles that we live here in the global north or the power structures that we have here in the global north or the corporations that we have here in the global north. I've always been really interested in that connection um, and trying to figure out how we can stabilize it, how we can make conditions not only safer and more climate resilient, but also more equitable. And so my thesis was really an opportunity for me to uh, inspect a part of the international system that I think most people have an assumption is inherently good-hearted and certainly I think it is, but NGOs and particularly the relationship between NGOs in the global north that often have more resources, often have a little bit more freedom, um, and oftentimes are 
doing a lot of work to interact with uh, forces in the global south are very different in a lot of ways from uh, organizations that are fixed in places like Bangladesh that tend to have fewer resources. Um, you know, oftentimes populations might not be as interested or they might have a lot more restraints on what they can do just based on the laws in their home country. So for me, one thing I had heard actually a lot about growing up was kind of a little bit of, I don't know what the right word is, maybe frustration um, that people in Bangladesh have had working with partners in the global north. So I actually have a lot of intimate family connections who, who work with larger NGOs in Bangladesh, not in environment, but in other development areas, who have stated a lot that they haven't felt they have a lot of agency over their agendas or get frustrated with the way you know they've had to handle reporting mechanisms with their global north partners and so i really wanted to see if that was going to be the case in the relationships between different environmental ngos working on climate change and so during my undergraduate years i had the opportunity to sit down with a few practitioners both from the global north uh, and from bangladesh who do that kind of work just to talk about their relationship with their partners on either side of the aisle and to hear what they had to say. And so I definitely got the sense that people in the global north tend to feel that there's a growing move towards equity, that you know, they, we really conquered this kind of white savior mindset and that we're moving towards very equitable, conversation-based, dialectic partnerships. Now, the feeling I got from people in Bangladesh uh, was very different than that. So while there's definitely been improvements over time, the overwhelmingly I heard from practitioners who work at environmental NGOs in Bangladesh that they don't really feel like the NGOs or funders that they work with from the global north view them as equal partners. They often feel like they are funders and they are just sources of money that have to be placated to ensure that they're able to do the work that they want to do. And so in particular, I think the things that really, really stood out to me were just the kinds of burdens that come from things like monitoring and evaluation that are required by global Northern partners. Uh, in particular, you know, I had heard from one person who worked at a pretty well-known NGO in Bangladesh, who said that because of the accounting requirements for their funding that were placed on them by both the funder and their NGO counterpart in the global North, they had to hire several new people to be able to do the accounting required. And those people had to be people who were educated in the West, which was an extreme expense. It took up a lot of the funding and that's funding that they weren't able to use to do the actual project that they had been funded for. It took a lot of manpower and a lot of hours to be able to meet those requirements. And that ultimately felt like they weren't able to actually focus in the field and do the work that they wanted to do. So things like that, I think really stood out to me and are things that we really need to be focusing on moving forward. Okay, and this is the, you know, obvious but big question that follows from that, which is how do we help ameliorate those disproportionate responsibilities between northern and southern NGOs? And what responsibilities do each of the parties have to help that amelioration? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a very difficult question. For me, I think one of the important first steps is that here in the global north, and that comes from me as someone who's had the opportunity to work with a lot of organizations here, um, we do really need to try to acknowledge that while there's been a lot of strides that have been made in the equity space between the global north and global south on things like this, that there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think that we can't sit and be satisfied with that um, and to just celebrate the victories, but also to think about what needs to happen moving forward. I also think that there needs to be a stronger acknowledgement of that power differential. So while going to a partner and, you know, having a conversation is a good start really opening it up and letting them know that just because funding is coming from this side to that side doesn't mean that they aren't equal partners and that they should feel comfortable to voice their discontent at any of the requirements attached to their funding or any of the implementation that the project is going to be going through to really really encourage them and build that space for partners in the global south to be able to have open dialogues and to be honest because I think while those conversations are beginning in a lot of spaces, my feeling from speaking to people in Bangladesh was that they didn't feel like they could be honest. Um, they felt like they had to kind of tamper what they were saying or tamper the complaints. And that wasn't the case in all situations. Certainly heard a lot of very positive feedback from partners in Bangladesh who have worked with organizations 
or they felt like they had a very equal say or they felt very comfortable, but it sounds like that's still the minority of experiences and not the majority. In terms of the monitoring evaluation, that also goes back to a lot of the work I was mentioning with environmental peace building, which is that environmental or rather monitoring evaluation shouldn't be a one size fits all. We really need to start thinking about how we can adjust monitoring evaluation practices so that they work for a particular project and can capture the information about a project well, but also they work for the resources available for that project. Um, certainly, I don't think we want to be in a situation where we're spending more money on accounting than actually doing work and having accountability to the communities we're serving. Yeah, I agree with you that that monitoring and evaluation piece often, as you've talked about, takes up a lot of funding for partners and people working in this space. The other thing that I know you've worked on that takes up a lot of that funding and time is following along with environmental regulations internationally and within the United States. So we've talked a lot about your international work to this point, but you've also been involved with the Local Government Environmental Assistant Net Network, or LGEAN, which helps localities in the US comply with these environmental regulations. Can you talk a little bit about how that complements and diverges from your international work? Yeah, I would love to. I think that that was one of my favorite parts of being a research associate at ELI was just the two main projects I was working on were so different and yet there were still ways to see how they connected. So we've spoken a lot about the environmental peace building work, which as you can tell just from my discussion of the monitoring evaluation work uh, was a lot more conceptual and a lot more abstract. It was very international and very big ideas focused. At the same time, I was working a lot with the Local Government Environmental Assistance Network, uh, as you mentioned, we call it LGEAN for short, which is very focused on the US and very focused on local laws and how they fit in with federal regulation. So the goal of the Local Government Environmental Assistance Network is really to provide assistance to local governments across the country trying to meet their basic requirements and also exceed those requirements for environmental laws that we have on the books here in the US. And so for anyone who's looked at the Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act, you know that this can actually be a very, very complicated undertaking. These are very long <laughs> laws with a lot of different nuances to them. And particularly for local governments, they play a unique role because they are both a regulated entity, but also a regulator. And so it can be very complicated for them, especially for smaller towns that have fewer resources to be able to not only meet those expectations, but also just to know what they're supposed to be doing in the first place. And so. That's really where LGN comes in. And I think it's lovely to be able to see at the technical level how these things work and to kind of figure out what kind of complaints come in. Because a lot of times I think we think about just trying to pass laws that work. But already we have so many really great environmental laws on the books here in the States. Just being able to meet those is a very important next step. And so I think it's been a really nice complement to the international work because when you're working at a very large more abstract level and you're not working with a particular place or community, it helps to have that experience to be able to say, okay, I'm hoping that this outcome will happen in the abstract. And what does that look like at the ground level? So with the monitoring evaluation work, for example, it's very easy to say in the large picture, we need monitoring evaluation that's more comprehensive. But at the technical level, what does that mean? For someone who's going to be completing that work, what does that mean? And, you know, being able to sit down and hear about the kinds of issues that people run into with reporting for Clean Water Act uh, regulations, for example, it helps me to get a sense of what kind of difficulties people are coming against when you are working with a low resource environment and you are trying to do a million things at once. And it helps to kind of make things more realistic in that aspect. So seeing the way these different pieces come together, how the little technical bits and little individual experiences of people working at a small local level builds up into those larger international pieces and the loftier goals that we talk about as a global population has been a really wonderful experience. That is great that you've been able to see those parallels and really those surprising parallels, things you didn't expect to see. And one thing you actually said to me one time is that a benefit of working at ELI is you never know the ripple effects a project can have. Can you talk about you know, something you had worked on that ended up taking you in a direction you never imagined and how that impacted your personal path? Yeah, I really appreciate hearing that. And I do think that that's been one of the really rewarding parts of working with ELI is just the way things move and the way we can have these ripple effects. 
So I think that, that take a really good example of that comes from my work with environmental peace building. So I think that when I first started this project, it was interesting because I had heard about the environmental peace building program when I was still an intern working at ELI. I didn't have the opportunity to work on that project uh, that summer, but I was so excited to be assigned as the RA to be on environmental peace building when I started. And I think in my mind coming into this work, it seemed like this very large abstract, as I'd mentioned, very intangible thing. There's so many pieces to it. It talks about these very lofty concepts like peace. Um, you know, it's hard to define what peace is exactly, right? And so I kind of imagined that it would be very theoretical, very framework based, like not a lot of concrete examples to work with. And then being able to work on the modern evaluation project, it really broke down for me how technical this work is. And to really think about, you know, the different small pieces that come together to make up any intervention. You know, when we talk about something like peace, what are the pieces of that? What actors are involved in that? What are the, what are the dynamics that create peace? What kind of work has to go into that? How does that connect to the environment? What is What are the pieces of the environment that people are interacting with? How does that impact their relationship? And then just talking to individual people, getting their experiences of how their perspectives make up those concepts, how people view peace, how people view the environment, I think has been a really, really interesting part of the work here. And so much of the modern evaluation work has talked about this idea of unexpected consequences, how you can kind of work up to a project and you spend so much time thinking about what will my project be? What will its impacts be? and you can end up having a completely unexpected impact. Now, of course, as I mentioned, those can be negative ones, like we talked about at Virunga, but a lot of times they can also be extremely positive. I can remember an experience with the modern evaluation work uh, early on where we had decided to have a consultation to talk about and hear what people would actually want from a toolkit on environmental peacebuilding modern evaluation. And the conversation flowed naturally. People were talking and excited about the idea of it. And one thing led to another and people ended up expressing to us there was this huge interest in having a typology of environmental peace building, actually working to fully define the parameters of what makes up an environmental peace building intervention, really having a defining seminal piece of literature that discusses what environmental peace building is and what the boundaries of it are. And it was so exciting to be able to sit in like this nascent field. And when we had been talking about something that was so technical like modern evaluation and so nitty gritty that the conversation would loop back to this large abstract seminal document again. The way that just, you know, the conversation took us to a place and that led to the idea for a whole other project. I think it's really interesting to see how these different conversations that you have can be so influential in different ways. And for me in particular, I think it really helped me to figure out what I would want to do moving forward. I think coming to the Environmental Law Institute, my Career path has always been pretty, I've been pretty confident that I want to work on climate change. And I wasn't necessarily as confident that I wanted to do that from a legal perspective. But I've been able to see the technicalities of the law and the differences that particular words and the particular ways we shape regulations and policies and the way we put words to paper to define what we want um, to figure out those impacts. How everything very large and lofty starts with these really small details was fascinating to me and it really, really showed me that I wanted to work in the legal space of this of this movement. Yeah, and that is a great transition because you are going to law school next year and I would love to talk a little bit more about that, you know, what you hope to gain out of that legal education and also as you continue in this space, you know, you're planning to be here a long time, you're investing a long time in law school. How do you stay optimistic in the face of climate change? Yeah, I think that that's the question on everyone young person's mind these days. Um, I think it's fair, honestly, to not always be optimistic. I think we see a lot of really negative things happening. and I think it's very hard to to sit with that and, and to try to find good in it. But for me personally, having dedicated my life and my career to working on environmental issues and particularly working on climate change, I think it's hard not to be inspired by the kind of work people do and the kind of passion that people bring to this work. I had the opportunity um, working with environmental peace building to go to the United Nations Stockholm Plus 50 conference in June. And it was a very life-changing experience in that 
there was so much energy and people are very realistic. They're very aware of the practical experience we're having of the way that, you know, we're coming closer and closer to the 1.5 uh, degrees of warming that is such a seminal tipping point. And yet, regardless of that, people are thinking of a million new ideas of how to work better, more efficiently, how to work harder, where we can make changes, how we change our approach, what the international level can do, what the local level can do, what activists can do, what legal scholars can do, you know, making changes in every facet of the way we work. I mean, monitoring evaluation is something that I would never have thought of as an undergraduate as being particularly important to the movement, but it is so important that we sit and assess the way we do things and figure out how to do them better. And so being able to make an impact in a part of the movement like that has been extremely rewarding and one that I wouldn't have thought about earlier. And being able to realize that there's so many more ways that we can make changes and that we can make things better. We're finally starting to see movement here in the US on climate legislation. And I think that that's a reason to feel hopeful that things are gonna to continue to, at least in some ways, improve. And that if not mitigating climate change, at least we can work really hard to build our resilience. Yeah, and what a lovely note to end on, um, that positive change in the United States that we are starting to see. So I have one final question for you, and that is if people want to learn more about any of the things you talked about today or be more involved in this type of work, where should they go? Great question. Well, obviously, I'm happy to plug all of the resources that the Environmental Law Institute puts out. Um, if you want to learn more about the environmental peace building work we do or to be more involved in the environmental peace building work we do, I uh, highly recommend you check out the Environmental Peace Building Association at environmentalpeacebuilding.org. Uh, if you want to hear more about the work that I've done in Berkeley, highly recommend you check out uh, Berkeley's undergraduate environmental publication, Perennial. And if you want to reach out to me and have a conversation about what you think a law student should be doing moving forward or any ideas you have about what Yale Law School can do in this uh, context and in this work, please feel free to reach out to me over email as well. Shala, thank you so much again for joining us. I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me, Georgia. It's been such a pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.